Uh, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Can you please take your seats? We're about to start. Uh, yesterday, we did uh, a first part of the panel, which was 5,000 years of architecture and now what? And the idea was that technology might have something to do with it. And today, we're going to take a look at preservation, uh, regeneration, and, and uh, different names we call it. And we're very lucky to have Ton Buchner, who's uh, the CEO of Axo Nobel, Rem Kohlhaas, Francesco Bandarin, and Rem uh, Reinier de Graaf. Voilà. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for uh, coming uh, to the second part of the session. Um, with us, uh, Tom Buchner, uh, CEO of the Dutch uh, multinational Oxo Nobel, a company dedicated to paint and chemicals, although I think that latter thing I, I should recent, uh, increasingly less emphasize. Um, uh, Francesco Banderin, Assistant Director General uh, of Culture at UNESCO, former Director General of the UNESCO World uh, Heritage Center, also an architect uh, and an urban planner, trained uh, a Venetian by birth. Uh, and then, of course, Rem, architect, writer, theoretician, and of course, the curator of this uh, Biennale. Uh, my name is Rainier de Graaf. I'll be moderating uh, this session. Um, so we have a rather curious combination of, of individuals. Uh, we have uh, an architect who once uh, proclaimed that his intellectual life was dedicated to modernization um, and modern architecture. We have uh, somebody who's probably got the most prestigious career imaginable in the domain of preservation, which in the traditional perception might be a means that prevents modern architecture from getting out of control. Uh, and then we've got the CEO of a paint company. Very welcome. Um, so the very first obvious question that I want to ask uh, the each of you is what, what brings you here? And I'd like to kick off with uh, Tom. Well, thank you, uh, Rainier. Uh, first of all, before I answer your question, I want to uh, congratulate Rem with an amazing Biennale that we have here. It's really fantastic to walk around and, uh, and the tour we could make together uh, was really a very special event. Now, why is Oxnobel here? Well, Oxnobel is a company that is basically the largest in paints and coatings worldwide and 60% of our revenues worldwide are in the buildings, infrastructure and transportation industries. So when it comes to the central theme of urbanization, basically 60-70% of what our people do comes in some form or fashion into urbanization. Now, urbanization is kind of a buzzword, it's kind of a general trend, and it has two aspects. Most people immediately think about the functional aspects of urbanization. How do I get roads? How do I get buildings? How do I get all kinds of things like infrastructure and wireless connections for the internet? But what is very often forgotten is the emotional part of cities and the emotional discussion around how do people feel in cities? How do you make a city from a survivable city to a livable city to an enjoyable city? That's what Oxnobel is truly interested in. I mean, we do sell paint, but paint basically means color and color basically means emotion. All of you walk around the Biennale, there's lots of plays with colors here, and color really affects you, either consciously or unconsciously, when it comes to driving the emotional feeling you have walking around cities and infrastructure. And what we see in those discussions is that that emotional aspect is missing. We see also that when it comes to color, that people either focus on single individual objects and rarely on cities or regions or neighborhoods, and that color gets considered very, very late in the process. And these are things that happen both in new cities, but very also often also in regeneration of cities, cities that have a rise and a fall and need to be regenerated. And that color aspect, that emotional aspect, is very often forgotten. And that's why we as a company actually have launched what we call the Human Cities Manifesto. And color is a central part of it, but there's more aspects to the Human Cities Manifesto, which one, as you probably have seen on many of your chairs, includes the color, 
but it also looks at the preservation of heritage. Heritage that we all have in our cities, not only the nice and beautiful things, but also the things that are indications of parts of lives and certain decennia of living. We also look at education. We look also at play space in cities, and we really support it as a company wherever we are present. So overall, our human cities concept is something that we are truly passionate about because we're driving it in five fundamental aspects, including things like education and sustainability, which have to be part of the design and the early phase thinking when it comes to making cities human, making cities better and more livable. And that is something that we as Axel Nobel and I personally as Tom Buchner are very passionate about. And that's why we're here. That's why we're doing this with partners. That's why we work together with Rem and the colleagues to make sure that the combined effort in making cities more emotionally fitting and more human is something that we can stand for as an organization overall. We want to be part of it as Axel Nobel and I love to be part of it as a CEO. That's why we're here. Okay. Um, Francesco, um, Tom basically touched upon the relation between COLA uh, and, and preservation, and, and OXO uh, has also done work uh, in that domain. But I remember a very interesting story you told me, uh, and it's actually about, in a way, the opposite. Um, you told me the story of Rome, that we know Rome as the city that is ochre. Uh, we think that is authentic, we think that is genuine, but actually Rome at one stage was also blue, and is about to become blue again. Is what What is in your view, the relation between color and authenticity? I see color is, uh, is part of the shape of things and it's part of, uh, as you say, our emotions. So it's, very, it's a very important component of, uh, uh, of heritage, built environment and so on. Now, what color? It depends on society and the perception that we have of it. It changes with history. I was telling you the story of Rome because when I went to Rome like 25 years ago to work, Rome was painted in yellow, red, and ochre. And if you go today, you, you hardly find these colors. They're all bluish, whitish, and so on. So there was a transition in this period and that somehow obliterated what was uh, uh, the color brought by the, by the, the, by the king of Italy you know, who, and the military that uh, took Rome in the, in the 19th century as the capital of Italy. They, they actually painted it as a military color, you know, this caserman color. And I think there was a big effort to go back to what, you know, an ideal Rome of uh, the 16th, 17th, 18th century was. And there was a big debate among archaeologists, uh, art historians, and so on. And at the end, uh, this kind of solution came about. And that's why the Quirinale is white today, and it was uh, red and ochre a few years ago. Um, this is one thing of preservation. It's not the only, the only one. But it shows the connection, which I think is very important for this discussion between preservation and modernity. I always say that preservation is part of modernity. It did not exist before modernity. It did not exist. It was just the antiquarians, uh, the collectors, but preservation was created by modernity. We have to find, again, this connection. This connection was lost uh, in the 20th century uh, because uh, uh, modernism um, cr broke the relationship between uh, you know, the, continues, the continuum of urban development and the new uh, revolutionary system that was imposed in starting the 1920s. Um, but this connection uh, is fundamental. And if, unless we understand it in its really deep meaning, unless we find it back, we will lose a very important resource for the future, which is our past. But it's, it's interesting that in a way what you hint at is that what we think is real, what we think is preserved, is actually sometimes a completely staged uh, version of the past, which would essentially make preservation a very modern it is, uh, scenographic... It is like yeah. this. It is like this. Uh, monuments uh, change all the time. We imagine them as a fixed in time. They're not, especially architecture. They have to be renewed and, re and changed and so on. So, so the scope of professionals, and we have many here, you know, is to find what is the best thing, the best way in preserving the values that are embodied on the monuments. But their, ma their material uh, being, uh, the material state uh, has to change. So there is, every society defines uh, its own uh, authenticity and its own integrity. Rem, in, I believe it was 2005, you were also uh, present here. It was actually in the Art Biennale uh, with an exhibition which was called Expansion and Neglect. 
Uh, and the interesting thing there was that you highlighted neglect actually as a fundamental aspect uh, of preservation, where in a way uh, you could say you observed the discovery of something authentic as the most important threat uh, to its, its, its authenticity. But once you take that position, then preservation seems very much related to the fading uh, of colors, which is almost inherent uh, in neglect. Um, it is <clears throat> true that in the context of Venice, I've made uh, two uh, presentations that were connected to uh, preservation. The first one was expansion and neglect, where I used the relative neglect that you could discover at the time in the Hermitage Museum uh, to compare it with the bloated scale of a lot of contemporary art institutions. Uh, in the past uh, 20 years, museums have become bigger and bigger, art has become bigger and bigger, and therefore we live uh, partly in a very bloated world, and I was taking the relative uh, decay of the Hermitage as a kind of antidote to that kind of world. And you could say that at the time I thought that the only pure form of preservation was to leave things decay and become ruins uh, almost uh, the natural way. And what I've discovered when we later became more interested in the whole notion of preservation, that there are two schools of preservation. One is the kind of romantic school, which says the ruin is the only pure uh, form in which buildings can end and, and remain authentic. The other one is uh, the uh, to be preserved element needs a constant layer of maintenance uh, and constant needs needs to be thought of. And so, in a later presentation, uh, which is was also the occasion where we met, I uh, made almost the opposite uh, element that preservation was now a key element of the architecture agenda, and independently of you we came to the conclusion that yes, in fact, uh, preservation was not the opposite uh, of modernity, but actually a key element of diversity, and that at the moment that you want to change everything, you need to also define that which uh, kind of remains. So uh, where we, when we encountered each other, we first thought we would be in a kind of acute collision, uh, we actually uh, agreed beyond uh, what we initially thought was possible. So I now realize that kind of preservation and maintenance are intimately connected, uh, and that, uh, as you suggest, uh, that means that kind of preservation is the projection on a given existing object of a constantly changing image of authenticity. Uh, and uh, uh, that, that therefore preservation actually means change. On that mm -hmm. note, mm -hmm. I, I, I would, if you, Tom, if you will allow me, I would just briefly uh, like to explain a project you did. It's, it's for the town of uh, uh, Sorland in, in, in the north of Norway. Uh, an unbelievably grey town, uh, ergo uh, depressing, grey equals depression in the contemporary conscience, where according to the tourist guide, the only thing worth doing was fill up your gas tank uh, and move on. Uh, Oxo painted that gray blue, bright blue, but the interesting thing is that that, I mean, most people don't know the town. Uh, you look at the blue and you uh, assume that, you know, Oxo restored something to its former glory that actually never existed. So here the maintenance became a form of creativity. So do you think that in a way, the, the boundary between preservation and innovation has definitively changed. That's correct. That's truly correct. Because each society has to choose for themselves whether preservation is total decay, which it probably most of the time is not, but it is also, also not a total copy of what was there, either because technologies have changed or because it's not what people want. What people are looking for is the emotional impact that a city, a village, a neighborhood has uh, to become 
more livable, more enjoyable, and creates more innovative aspects. And here, we did not go back to the past. We actually created something new, and the result is a city that is incredibly proud, has become a magnet for visitors, uh, and it had nothing to do with preservation going back to the past. It wasn't leaving things decaying, but it was creating something new, and that connection between the fact that centrally is the emotion and whether it's preservation or creation or innovation, it all works depending on what the society likes, wants, and intends to create. But in essence, they were proud of something that wasn't heritage. And, and it, 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 in a way, demonstrates in a very interesting way the artificiality of emotions also. Mm -hmm. you know, when we talk about the city as a source of emotions, uh, which emotions do we refer to it's 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 in a very interesting things that uh, that human emotions related to artificiality of course come very close to a form of sentimentality in in theory as well well there's there's many many aspects to emotion i mean colors are subject to fashion fashion are subject to time uh, and they combined with creativity are a constantly moving object and yes the fact that people are proud of this town doesn't mean that they were proud of the town 10 years ago they are proud of what is created together with them but that essentially makes preservation an almost prospective activity which i think Indeed. is a very liberating aspect uh, of that project i we we've been talking touching upon the city and, and preservation. And I would like to ask uh, Francesco, you have written a lot about cultural landscapes and the difference between a cultural landscape and a landscape is that a cultural landscape involves interaction with people. So I guess the city in a way conforms to that definition um, of a cultural landscape. What do you think that the shift in focus when it comes to preservation from buildings to city actually means? Well, this is a, it's not a simple issue because there are many cities in the world of different characters. You know, one thing is Venice and one thing is Shenzhen, a city of 15 million that didn't exist uh, 25 years ago. So we have to look at them with different uh, tools perhaps and understand also the differences that, uh, of approaches and uh, there is not one single approach. There is not uh, one size fit all uh, mechanism uh, for, for this. But certainly one thing that we had uh, um, tried to, to innovate in the, in, our, in the system, in the thinking of uh, uh, heritage uh, management, of heritage, uh, in the heritage world, is to try to look at cities not as a group of monuments, which is the present definition. Even today, when we put a, a site, a city in the World Heritage List, it is defined as a group of monuments. It's, a, it's an absurdly uh, antiquated definition. A city is much more than that. It, uh, it's an, uh, first of all, it's a, it's a built complex so that has you know, high, high moments, uh, monuments, and then uh, tissue or fabric of uh, um, perhaps sometimes uh, even irrelevant uh, individual objects, but as a complex, they're interesting. It is always a natural environment. A uh, city is sitting somewhere. We know in Venice, it's sitting in, in the lagoon. Every city has its own natural environment. We forget about this. It is a, a, a layering of process. No city is built uh, you know, in, a, in, a, in a moment. They're built on centuries. So we have to understand and learn how to read the different layers in order to better understand how also how to preserve the values that each layer represents. The city is uh, places of memory, intangible dimensions. So all these uh, dimensions uh, uh, were a bit uh, forgotten. Essentially, the architects uh, looked uh, at the monumental aspect of the city. So we're trying to bring them back because we think that this integrated uh, vision of the city is much more interesting. It much more so represents the society and what the society wants out of, of its heritage. And it's a way also to link, and again, I come back to the, <laughs> the, what I was saying earlier, to link preservation and modern development, uh, something that we are used to consider separately. Even the laws, the legislations are different. You know, the historic districts are separated uh, from the rest of the city. They're treated differently. Uh, they have different rules, uh, which in a way sometimes uh, ha helps preserving them, but also condemns them in becoming kind of a precinct of tourism and, uh, and other types of, uh, of functions. So we have to bring back uh, the historic dimension of city into its development, its modern, its modern uh, evolution. I, I guess what you're saying is that ultimately history is more than a collection of architectural masterpieces. Absolutely. And on that note, I, I believe, Rem, you once, in those terms, looked at the Berlin Wall, 
uh, well, we can debate whether it's a masterpiece or was uh, a masterpiece, very much uh, in those terms. Um, yeah, I agree. Uh, 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 my whole life, uh, you could say, is a campaign to defend the legitimacy of the mediocre uh, and, and of the kind of regular and of the generic. Uh, but I found a kind of heartbreaking limitation of um, the philosophy of preservation is that uh, what you actually would like to uh, preserve, and, and let's take the example of bridging, what you actually would like to preserve is a, is a way of life. And I once kind of uh, analyzed the Hutong. The Hutong was uh, a perfect little uh, cosmos. Uh, where a family could live a kind of very intense uh, urban life uh, with very little means, uh, with almost no money. And when I kind of really analyzed very carefully how each of the components of that cosmos, where they came from, how old they were, where they were made, it, it turned out that kind of nothing in that whole cosmos was older than uh, 1956. Uh, that it was made kind of partly of the debris of uh, kind of building site of a modern uh, construction site. And so uh, at the same time that there was a very authentic, unbelievably impressive, intelligent way of living in a city uh, that had been constructed with the debris of consumer society uh, and that in architectural terms had zero merit and that was also made in a way that you could actually physically never preserve it because it's, the materials were so debased. Uh, and that, for me, still remains the critical dilemma of preservation. Are you actually interested in preservation, the thing, or are you interested in preserving the culture or the contents on the, or the anthropology? Uh, and uh, particularly in Beijing, that is a kind of very a crucial issue, of course, because there is, uh, of course, also a way in which you could see the New York Times complaining about the uh, uh, disappearance of Hutongs in China as a kind of almost imperialistic way of dictating to one culture uh, that it should preserve its old-fashioned, uh, unmodern parts. Uh, by another culture that has already destroyed its own equivalent. And uh, for me, that is a crucial moment that we are facing now, and you also see it in this uh, Biennale, I think, that uh, some of the most energetic parts of the national pavilions are, are coming from countries uh, that are very remote to us, and uh, for whose culture we are much more uh, uncertain in terms of judgment. And uh, to some extent, preservation is, of course, a judgment. Tom, um, Rem touched upon preservation as something which oscillates between the material and the immaterial. I think there's something very interesting about your domain. You know, paint is material, ultimately, although it's 2D. Uh, color is immaterial. Um, does what Rem says resonate? It very much does, because in many ways, when people talk about preservation, they talk about objects and things and materials, and, and they think we go back to what it was in history. Uh, where we as an organization come from, and what we notice in the discussions with populations, with neighborhoods, when we talk about preservation of their way of life, it is what they're looking for is preserving the experience. So even when we do things like the Palazzo do Sale here in Venice, or Portofino, or when we make city plans in Italy, color plans for cities in, in Italy, when we do museums in the Netherlands that see monuments by themselves, the preservation in the end is always a combination of preserving the experience far more than the physical building and the materials that are always very different. And very often they have that added component of creativity that we talked about in that city earlier. And in the end, that preservation therefore becomes experience preservation with innovation combined. So that, that resonates because there is no single answer and for us, it's therefore been extraordinarily important to involve the communities when we build these color plans, when we build these things, when we act on preservation wishes of a population.
so when you have a question uh, to, to Tom, you talk about we, uh, and uh, that is always interesting to, to ask who, who is we. Um, I would like to uh, take two situations. Uh, they're both uh, a little bit theoretical. Um, let's take uh, the former East Germany uh, and let's take the city of Berlin. I'm sure that there was a huge bureaucracy there uh, that established the norms for preservation. It is probably established uh, the entities that needed to be preserved and it probably had a kind of very probably uh, underpinned by art historical knowledge uh, of the deepest uh, German kind, uh, a prescription what restoration actually meant. So uh, I would say there was a, a larger body of the state uh, that defined the values that uh, um, preservation needed to contain. We have now slipped in a kind of situation which is, uh, let's say, 20 years of market economy 20 years of uh, um, narratives that the market is innovative and that the market kind of provides the tools that we need. Uh, and you comfortably describe yourself as a, we, we made a city plan, we uh, made a color plan for a particular city. Who in this case is we? And in whose authority do you speak? Well, when, we, when I talk about we, then it is the actual, in this particular case, city plans, color plans with cities, they are generally done in a combined effort, and that's why I use the word we, between government officials that are the top-down thought patterns of this is what we want, um, architects that are major components in saying maybe going back to history is not preserving the experience as well as we want. It is we, the people of Axel Nobel, that actually develop with our knowledge we have dedicated people looking at the psychology of colors. Uh, we look at the cultural background of colors and then bring that into the discussion as well. And out of this combined discussion comes a result which can be a color plan, which can be a design for a renovated museum or a harbor. And rarely is this total decay or complete preservation and going back to history always does this end up being a combination of preserving the experience with new components in it. Um, I, I, I was thinking, uh, Francesco, about, about your beautiful story that the color of Rome is ochre. I, I was just wondering to myself what the color of this Biennale is after having wandered through all the country pavilions. And I think it's beton brut. Uh, the immutable uh, identity of modern architecture, not white, uh, beton brut, which curiously involves the absence um, uh, of paint. And it's actually a question to both of you. To what extent do you think color? To what do you think, uh, to what extent do you think paint as a means towards color could actually provide, uh, like in a way Rome has turned blue, uh, could beton brut turn you know, whatever, and, and be continued in an endless cyclus of lives like, like rainbow colors. I think that nobody more than Tom knows that color is ephemeral. It's an ephemeral component of, of, of matter. Uh, the Greek statues were painted, and the temples as well. Uh, we know them as white, uh, and we will never, never paint them uh, today because we will not uh, desecrate them, uh, desecrate their whiteness. Um, yes, I've seen the 66 pavilions. Beton Bru is the color, that's for sure, but Beton Bru has many nuances also, you know, it, it varies. You know, sometimes it's very, it's very gray and uh, flat, sometimes it's full of vibrations and sometimes there's a lot of uh, colors uh, attached to it or fragments, so it is also a material that needs to be explored. It's for me always curious, you know, that Beton Bru is also the architecture of the welfare state. So you got a very curious situation where a very benign, intentionally top-down human ideology manifests itself through the most hardcore, probably most vilified material. Um, you have a manifesto on, on, on human cities. Uh, nevertheless, there is Beton Bru um, at the Biennale. Have you, uh, in a way, grown to like Beton Bru more? And in a way, can you resign to the absence of paint, irrespective of your role? <laughs> 
Well, I can partially agree with the fashion color of the Biennale today where we feel this color coming back. It has come in waves, uh, the absence or the presence of color. Uh, what, it has, what has generally happened is that it's been a temporary situation or a purely functional way of thinking to drive towards that color, as you call it. And by the time people really want to experience some form of enjoyment of cities, the wish for color generally comes back. On that note, I would... Actually, you have your manifesto, Human Cities, which you... I think basically outlined in, uh, in the answer to the first question. I, I wanted to try a little experiment uh, on you, uh, on human cities, if you don't mind. Just on me. I, well, it, it'll, it'll, it'll implicate others. Uh, that'll become clear. But uh, anyway, I'd like to read to you uh, a few sentences from another sort of manifesto, I guess, written about 20 years ago. What is left after identity is stripped? What if the seemingly accidental move of cities away from difference towards similarity were an intentional process? What if we are watching a global liberalization movement down with character? Um, what do you think? I believe that that's a very dry description of functionality to the extreme, which if we have our true investigations in society, that is not what people that have to live in these places actually want. I would like to move to the author of this quote uh, on the far uh, left. It's, um, and, uh, well, I don't want to ask you about your um, quote, but there is a general, um, that there is a general sense, of course, that, uh, and you hinted on it earlier, Rem, about modernization and preservation being this different sides of the same medal. Nevertheless, if we you know, take the answer or the, the outcome of the test on Tom um, as, as a little bit of a, of a test, people, it's still a long stretch for people to not define the two in, in terms of opposites and not to perceive you know, the shift and the interest in preservation uh, as a radical shift or even denial of a former uh, position. Um, uh, I, I would like to uh, answer you a little bit uh, indirectly and to also include the uh, kind of issue of identity. Um, what I think is unbelievably uh, interesting in this uh, uh, Biennale is that by simply provoking the countries in uh, discussing the issue of identity and that uh, I've liberated uh, every nation to really think about uh, identity and uh, what is fascinating is that so many nations have, are actually presenting what they think their identity is but also uh, are presenting the enormous richness in the last 200 years and the incredible many moments that identity kind of in their countries changed. Um, but I find uh, kind of very heartening for the two th conclusions for an architect. And that one uh, conclusion is that um, each country has been producing modernities that uh, are not the modernities that take identity away, but actually modernities that characterize the country itself. Uh, and therefore, you can very clearly see that there is a North Korean modernity, a South Korean modernity, a Japanese modernity, an American modernity, and that uh, in spite of all the pressure uh, to homogenization, these different uh, modernities very often can be represented by modern buildings that are colorless, abstract, but that within all those seemingly similar things, uh, diversity kind of really uh, emerges. That is very exciting to me. What is discouraging for me as an architect is that not a single important architect has apparently participated in the history of the last 100 years in 66 countries. It's very noticeable that not a single architect plays a role in any of the uh, pavilions as a crucial figure. So uh, beyond my wildest dreams where I said uh, architecture, not architects, uh, this uh, uh, Biennale is um, 
completely uh, devastating in its conclusion of the irrelevance of architects. I, I will not start the debate about. <laughs> I will not start a debate about the fundamental difference between intention and outcome. Uh, but um, on that notion, I think there's something interesting. The brief to the country pavilions uh, was, in a way, a blunt statement about how modernisation had erased local identity, and of course, the reaction to that provocation was the fact that there is an immense amount of local identity as a result of that provocation. But also, in a way. Indirectly, you can enlarge that statement. You can say that something essentially homogenizing or with a kind of global program like modern architecture cannot help but in the end provoke identity once again while it supposedly replaced identity. So if identity emerges regardless, even in the face of the most brutal global er attempt to erase it, what does that mean for preservation as a discipline? Well, First of all, identity is a human uh, necessity, so it will always be found. People will always look for identity places, even if they don't have heritage. We try, of course, to preserve character and identity as we have inherited from the past, because that's, we think this is an important resource for, for people. Uh, but necessarily, there are other places that uh, do not have this. You know? So, I, in fact, I'm trying to understand also this. You know, some in emerging countries where you go, uh, very rapid urban development, you have places that have no history or little history. Do they, they don't have an identity? I, I don't believe. I think they, they have an identity. The identity is a social projection. So little by little, either spontaneously or through some act, action of, the, of, uh, of uh, our architects or public uh, powers and on, identity places are created. Uh, again, I would like to bring the example of Shenzhen, which I just visited. Now, Shenzhen didn't exist 25 years ago. Doesn't have an identity? I, I don't think so. They, they do, actually. Except that this identity doesn't look like the, the, what we associate to heritage. You know? It's associated to, to, to central places. In fact, at the core of Shenzhen, 15 million people, there is a big, a, enormous bookshop. The biggest bookshop I've ever seen in my life, 40,000 square meters of bookshop. So that's their identity. So there is always a drive, a push. Obviously, what we have inherited from the past uh, is uh, as, uh, as a layered uh, process. You know, it's very valuable. So that's why this is the whole spirit of conservation. We try to value identity that has been built across centuries and across uh, a multidimensional uh, history, very often complex. You know, and, and this helps a lot of people to, to find. But there is a difference between heritage and identity. Uh, the, and this difference is, is becoming more sensible these days. There was another thing that, that struck me. Of course, the, the concept uh, of the exhibition, I guess, in a way, is to aggressively assassinate the contemporary, or at least put the contemporary on hold uh, for, for about six months. But in looking at many of the, of the buildings that are displayed, which are often very beautiful buildings, essentially produced by architects which are not by definition famous. I mean, f famous beautiful buildings of, of largely unknown bureaucrats, even in, in cases. And in looking particularly at the pavilions dedicated to history, you get a sense is where did all this go? I mean, where did that way of practicing go? And I wonder to what extent actually this Biennale is a continuation of Chrono Chaos in 2010, where it's not just modern architecture that's under threat, but a way of practicing and, and maybe a profession that needs to be preserved. I, I think you're right. And in fact, you know, we've been used in the past 20, 30 years to consider architecture just the product of the, uh, the star system. You know, we see architecture essentially as a design of large and sometimes uh, uh, improbable buildings. I don't think that's architecture. Architecture is much, much more than that. And in fact, it is the, f the tissue and the fabric of our, of our lives. You know? So in, in a way, this Biennale brings it back to this uh, fundamental dimension. Let's look also you know, of, the, of, the, of the context where we exist, not, not just the, uh, the design uh, pro prowess of, uh, of a few number or small number of architects. It was indirectly also a question. Um, uh, um, I, I don't know, uh, really. But I would like to, there's one aspect we haven't really talked about. Um, we're talking about kind of real things in the real world, objects uh, and 
uh, tangible uh, entities. Uh, I think that one thing that the exhibition suggests is that we are uh, at the moment that uh, each of those uh, traditionally tangible elements of architecture will be um, infiltrated or bonded or doubled by digital technology. Um, uh, I think that could also have an important uh, uh, effect on a perception of color because uh, basically digital technology, we see it uh, usually projected through light and the colors of uh, the digital world are infinitely more uh, vivid, uh, captivating, hypnotic uh, than colors can be in the, in the real world. Uh, I have a question to you as in, in simply, do you think that this ubiquity of digital color that uh, invades every kind of part of the city and that also increasingly in, in infiltrates our houses, do you think that will uh, eventually have an effect of color in the real world? Yes, it will. Uh -huh. It absolutely will in our eyes. The digitization of color has started with the incredible challenge initially to say how can we copy the real color in something that is digitally defined. So it actually started the other way around where people wanted to find a binary definition of any color in the world. And after that has started to really work, we're one of the experts in doing so. Mm -hmm. We can actually, you know, if any car or infrastructure actually fades away over time and you want to repaint it, but you don't want it to bring it back to its original state, you need to actually reverse engineer it through the digital channel. And the next step that's taking place is that the digital colors start having a life of their own. And overall, the third step will be that we, again, as the expert in colors, will probably bring the digital color back into the real color again. And with that, we believe that we can turn the circle round. But at this point in time, we're primarily still in the science of digitizing color, which is very imperfect today. And today, people that experience colors in cars, in streets, in buildings, in interiors, in exteriors, still perceive those colors as warmer, having more depth and having less painful kind of emotions attached to it. That will change. And at that point in time, that digitization of color will become more real. But it will not mean the removal of real color in the life that we touch every day, because many in this room and others will touch some form of paints or coatings or color every day. And I'm not only saying with eyes and experience, but also with physical fingers. And in that, uh, it is truly something that we think will remain, but it'll make the full circle before we're there. But I, I, I wonder on that, that notion, because I mean, we've, we've touched upon color being in itself something incredibly ephemeral. So if you overlay something that already is ephemeral by the ephemerality of the digital, you get a kind of ephemerality to the, to the Macht X. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I was just thinking, because the digital has arrived in our profession, I think about 15 years ago, and there it made a change. Uh, to the, and, and particularly it started actually to change our discipline more, the more real it got, and the more it also made our discipline remote from some of its traditions in the sense that buildings that you see built now are the occasional freeze frames of a culture of renderings, which in a way create a certain amount of insensitivity in the contemporary eye to architecture's traditional sensation. And do you see any of that resonating in, in the domain of color per se? Only in part. And I guess you're talking very much at least in our perception and in, in the investigations that we do with our teams, when we, we don't only make colors, we constantly check the perception of colors with society. So when it comes to developing fashions of color, when it comes to what do people like, what do people experience, what is the psychology of colors, and there we do see digitization taking place, but people returning to what they can actually feel and touch still today. This may change, but it is still the primary desire of what we notice when we do our investigations. Do, do you realize that you're talking to the architectural community uh, that has been committed uh, for decades without any change to the color black? Uh, 
Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I do realize yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> but let us at least. But let us at least stimulate the thought uh -huh. that, that. And that's, of course, what is the advantage of, of doing constant investigations in society or what people desire. I mean, if, if we look at the fashion of black, yeah. it is fascinating how it comes back in waves. Generally not in interiors in our living room, generally not in our bedrooms and our bathrooms, but it comes back in, in, in certain fashionable applications. Uh, and overall, uh, the actual desire of color combinations changed drastically over time, uh, but rarely when it comes to living experience, and then not in individual objects like one building or one office, but in the overall experience of a neighborhood, there we haven't seen that coming back so but strong. But I, I always wonder what the, I always wonder whether black is the color, what beton brut is the architecture. <laughs> but uh, black, uh, black is the color cloth. is the color of priests, and that's what the architect thinks they are. Okay. <laughs> well, on, on that note, um, I have to admit that there is uh, a major flaw uh, in my preparation, in the sense that I do not know. Uh, whether this discussion is meant to involve the audience, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, are there any questions to the panelists? And are there microphones or...? There were, there were microphones. Any questions? Yeah, I have a question to Rem. I've seen your show Chrono Chaos, which was very impressive. Uh, what was changing between Chrono Chaos and this Biennale? What is new or what are new? What is a new perception of you of our world? What happened in this in the past year? Mm, I, I don't think that much. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I don't think it's a kind of question that I should should answer. Uh, basically, what always what uh, people are always underestimating is the extent to which each uh, creative effort uh, is largely dictated by um, by intuition, uh, of course, also by intelligence and information. But uh, I I can safely say that. Uh, I, before I was asked to do the Biennale, I had a kind of vague feeling that there were important uh, modification changes happening inside architecture and, and also an instinct uh, that perhaps not looking at the whole thing but looking uh, simply at the level of detail and under microphone we might discover new things. So uh, it is perhaps part of a kind of general uh, curiosity, but uh, I cannot explain it in terms of then we thought this and then our convictions were these and now they have modified. It, it is a much more intuitive kind of and constant uh, adjustment. <clears throat> but let me add how important was the chrono chaos for our world, huh? because uh, we're not used to be questioned. You know? We think we're right. The pre conservation is normally entrenched and you know, it's, it's the the last of the Mohicans against the barbarians at the gate. <laughs> but with the questions that are raised by Chrono Chaos, I think are very important questions. You know, what to preserve, how to preserve, to which extent we, have, we can uh, you know, define something that is worth being preserved. So I think it's a very important question and I would like to uh, incorporate them in our, in our system. Any more questions? More questions? I have a question to Francesco Mandarin about colonial heritage and, and identity. Do you have any uh, ideas, long-term ideas about this? Let me give you a story because I think it's important. Chandigarh in India, the greatest uh, say, realization of Le Corbusier's thinking. So we thought it was so good, so important, that it was worth putting in the World Heritage List. So we went to see the Indians and said, well, you have Chandigarh, you know, look, you have really something. And they said, but this is a European city, it's not an Indian city. I said, no, 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 look at, look at that, it's, it is an Indian city. You know? In fact, it has become Indian, probably the concept originally was a European origin, but it has become Indian. 
you know, the, the houses, uh, modern houses, but they're Indians, the way the streets are used. The, the city is the capital of two states. So in 10 years' time, we actually convinced the Indian government that that was an Indian city. I think that's the case. We have to, this transition, we call it sometimes shared heritage. You know, it's what's important. You know, cities don't belong to, to a culture or another. They belong to the people that live there. Maybe one addition there. I guess the preservation argument is, a, is an important one. But I think when, when we have spoken about, and I'm using the word we again, mm -hmm. uh, about the human cities concept for us, preservation is only one part of it. Because we're very much talking about the emotional experience of a city. Color is only one part. Preservation in all its variations is a second part. But creating positive play space combined with education and driving creativity that way is also an incredibly important part. And the variations on how people preserve are very often also driven by how people educate, drive sustainability and generate play space. And therefore the preservation topic on its own is very nice, but it gets influenced by a tremendous amount of additional factors when people want to make a city livable, enjoyable, and create it as a human city. Uh, one more question here. Um, yes, I was wondering uh, about the term preservation itself, which seems to me rather limiting. Um, uh, getting back to this whole question of uh, preservation being identified with modernity, uh, preservation suggests um, imminent loss and therefore the need to preserve and that in itself is a very modern sentiment where one sees history as something that is different and therefore you know slipping away i'm wondering whether in both in um, well, in all of your um, thinking and practices whether the term reuse which seems to me have a has a much more uh, long-standing history in terms of culture's attitude to the given whether the term reuse has any practicality or um, contribution. Well, preservation or, or conservation we were discussing today is actually there in, in our system are quite equivalent although they have different origins because preservation comes from the natural environment and conservation from the built environment but today they're almost interchangeable uh, they're more you preservation is more used in, in the anglo-saxon context and conservation in the rest of the world. But anyway, let's not go into philological things. <clears throat> Essentially, you know, it depends what you put in the, this is a box called preservation. What do you put in this box? If conservation, preservation is you know, maintaining anything identical as it is uh, and in its physical constituency, this is clearly a European concept you know, and something that is enshrined in the basic text, the Charter of Venice. This city was... <laughs> 50 years ago, that was 1964, when uh, the Charter of Venice was signed. But you know, this is really difficult to apply to many contexts. And along the, the years, you know, many other different models have emerged, uh, especially in Asia or in Australia and so on, where, in fact, what is, we try to look at is, of course, the, ma the material uh, substance is very important, but it's considered as the support of the values to be preserved. It's not the value itself, it's the support of the values. So if you shift this, uh, this, this point of view, then you, you see that the values are more important than the support. You can actually adjust and adapt to preservation to many contexts. One more question. I have a question about is color emotions? I think color is very much emotions in the industry to sell products, to to tap into desires. I was thinking of Cezanne, for instance, the way he used color uh, and making paintings in nature to, to have to use color as a kind of method of depth and questioning. So it's not, so I like to ask Rem Kohas, because he is one of the few architects who does use color quite often. Is color for you emotions or does color also have other qualities? Um, I, I don't think, um, but actually I had a very uh, positive and good relationship with color uh, until I turned uh, 45 uh, and, and then it suddenly stopped. Uh, I knew exactly how to color things, what to, elements to color, but at some point I became more interested in using color simply in terms of the I inherent color of different materials and I became interested in shifting uh, 
to a composition of materials rather than to, to uh, apply color. Um, so I don't know whether this is a kind of sign of maturity or melancholy, uh, uh, or whether it is a kind of temporary condition that, for instance, uh, through the digital could be kind of resurrected or could oblige me uh, to or, or us to uh, kind of work uh, again with more deliberation in in color, but I have a kind of and this is what the question that I wanted you to 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 uh, to answer. Uh, for me, color now with all the techniques we have at our disposal is more an issue of light uh, than paint, uh, and and uh, I think that in the exhibition there is a kind of a lot of beginnings of uh, that suggestion that it will be light that is going to color our world kind of more than paint, but uh, it's a kind of, kind of instinct. Well, to answer that question, uh, light has created a tremendous additional experience when it comes to experiencing color. And whether it is fully replacing color, in some applications it will, um, in others, we, and that's not because we have a vested interest in it, but we today believe that there is a long-term place for physical color uh, and that not all color will be replaced by light, but that light will play a very significant additional role in improving the experience of color. We totally agree. On that note, uh, and then there was light. Um, I would like to end the uh, panel discussion. Thanks very much, Tom Buchner. Thank you, Francesco Banderin. Thanks, Rem, for attending. Bye.